Let's talk about where we're at right now. So we just passed our insulation inspection. Um, all that is done. So the walls are ready to get covered up. Now I have a bunch of leftover insulation that I'm going to give to a friend who's going to be insulating his attic. So that way all this leftover insulation is not going to go to waste. Um, the majority of this room is going to get three quarter inch plywood, which I still have to get delivered. Um, now the one wall in here, this back wall over there, is going to be drywall. That has to be drywall. So I have the drywall here, and that's what I'm going to start with. So I'm going to throw all the sheets on. It should be about seven sheets to cover everything. And um, then some of this other uh, drywall is going to be for the um, guest house on the other side. I've already got quite a lot done over there. Um, and uh, But I'm not going to show you all that because that's kind of boring. So. Uh, let's go this uh, saying some drywall This has got to be one of the easiest drywall jobs possible It's one wall 20 feet wide and 10 feet tall Already fully sheathed with minimal wires and pipes behind it This one wall had to be drywall because it's the dividing wall between the living space and the workshop I sheathed a portion of the wall, but the majority was done by the builders So I went through and checked to make sure none of the nails were sticking out if they were, I hammered them flush. I started with the first sheet of drywall. It's important to get the bottom row of drywall as level as possible because the rest of the sheets sit on the first row. If the bottom row is off, then the rest will be off. I used some shims to work the sheet to the right height. There's a curb at the base of the back wall. It's small, about an inch and a half, but it's there so the wall doesn't get affected if I'm working with water. Okay, the first sheet was in the right place so I could start popping in some screws. The wall is sheathed, so a screw will bite anywhere I put it. However, because of all the nails for the sheeting, I knew exactly where the studs were. There's also tick marks on the ground showing their locations. I drove one and five eighth inch drywall screws into the wall. Those will reach through the materials and into the studs easily. I'm using a special drywall bit that doesn't allow you to drive the screws in too far. It's designed to only allow you to put them just below the surface of the drywall. If you drive them in too far, it lessens the screw's effectiveness and makes it more difficult to mud over the holes. It could also cause me to fail the drywall inspection. It worked great for the most part. However, some screws were a bit stubborn and didn't quite go in all the way. I'll come back to that in a bit, but for now, I'm just trying to get some sheets on the wall. I was required to put screws every 12 inches on the maximum, but was told to aim for every 10 inches just to be safe. Normally, the edges of the drywall sheets are supposed to meet up at the center of a stud. That's the proper way to do it, and how I did it on the inside of the guest house. However, here, since the wall is fully sheathed and I'm aiming for the least amount of material waste as I can, I used full sheets wherever I could. I just pretended that there was a stud there and drove the screws into the sheathing. I had to cut a partial piece for the end. I took a measurement, used a drywall T-square to get a straight line, and cut with a utility blade. First run, I scored the paper. Then I made a few more runs to cut through a portion of it, but not all the way through. I picked it up, gave it a good knee to the kidneys, and folded the sheet at the seam where I cut it. I used the box blade to cut the paper in the back, and then I had my newly cut piece of drywall. I put the factory edge with the other drywall factory edge, and my cut edge went to the right wall, where it'll eventually be covered up with plywood sheathing. Okay, first row is on and moving on to the second row. This row was a piece of cake because there's no shimming required. It just sits on the first row. It's bad to have four drywall corners all meet up on the same wall. So to stagger my seams, I just started from the right. If you noticed, I waited to put screws on the top edge of the first row until the second row sheet was above it. If you go too close to the edge and have a blowout or damage the edge, it could prevent the next sheet from sitting in the right place. This is applicable to side to side edges as well. Now, in order to give the illusion that I'm lining the sheets up with a stud, I actually trimmed this middle sheet a bit to line it up with a stud. I may have also trimmed it because the drywall edge was going to line up too close to a sheathing seam. The upper areas of the second row was just a bit out of my reach, so I brought in the ladder. Okay, time for the top row. 
I double checked to make sure no nails were sticking out, then measured the size of the sheet I needed. I marked up and cut the sheet hot dog style. I cut it pretty much exactly in half, so one sheet covered most of the top row. All I needed was one small piece to fill the top right corner, for which I used a leftover scrap from a hanging drywall in the guest house. After all the sheets were hung, I went through and added screws anywhere I missed, and in any place where the screws were more than 12 inches apart on the vertical. I counted all the screws I used to hang this drywall. If you want to guess the number, leave a comment and I'll let you know if you're right. Okay, the drywall is hung and now it's time for mud. I actually looked to hire this part out and got a couple of quotes, but the cost was just too far up there for something that I was just trying to avoid. I can do it and I know I'll do a good job, but I just know it'll take me a while to mud the entire guest house. This one wall is not daunting at all, so let's get to work. I dumped an entire box of mud in a bucket to use. The mud straight from the box is always a bit too solid, so I watered it down to make it more soupy. If it's not malleable enough, you get a rough surface that will require more work to make smooth. Think of it like this. Straight from the box is chunky peanut butter, and that's not gonna make a smooth surface. I'm turning it into creamy peanut butter. Before applying any mud, I needed to double check that all the screws sat below the surface. I used a metal drywall knife to do a sound test. It has a flat edge, so if it makes contact with the screw above the surface, you can hear a click. If it clicked, I used an impact driver to gently push the screw in however far it needed to go. I did this for the whole wall and checked every screw. Okay, time to start mudding. I rolled out some paper to protect the floor. I've been known to get a bit messy when mudding drywall. Professional drywall people probably have better techniques for doing this and definitely have a lot better tools. This is just how I do it. Drywall has essentially two kinds of joints. Taper joints, which in this case are the long horizontal seams, and butt joints, which are the vertical seams. I started with the tapered joints. At the long edge of drywall, the sides taper down. When two tapered edges are together, it forms a V to give a space to fill with mud and make the seam disappear. Here's a side view diagram showing what I'm doing. First, I put a thin layer of mud down to coat the crevice. Then rolled out a strip of tape right over the center of the gap. And followed that with more mud to cover the tape and lock it in place. Mud, tape, mud. The purpose of the tape is to prevent the seam from cracking, kind of acting like rebar for the mud. I'm going to leave that seam alone for a day because that's about how long it takes for it to dry. So I moved on to other things. Every single screw needs a bit of mud. That goes pretty quick. It's just important to get enough mud there the first time so you don't have to come back for a second pass. Butt joints work a bit differently. Because there's no taper at the edge, you basically have to make a small hill and wing it out so it's as gradual of a hill as possible. That'll happen in round two. The first pass is just about covering the seam. Just like before, mud, tape, mud. I repeated the process for the other seams, although when it was time for the horizontal seam at 8 feet up, I busted out the old drywall stilts so I could work on the entire seam at the same time without moving a ladder around.
Okay, first pass of mud was done, and I let it sit for a day. When everything was dry, I came back and sanded everything until it was as smooth as I could make it. This part is just finesse work. The key is to not over sand. Just do what's necessary so the second pass will be the final pass. It's just really, really dusty. I had an air purifier in the room to collect anything that didn't just fall straight down to the ground. If I wasn't wearing a mask, I'd be coughing for days. Here's how I checked where I needed more mud. I placed a floodlight so I could cast some shadows. At the taper joint, when I placed a straight edge across the seam, wherever the light pokes through is void that needs to be filled with mud. I did a pretty good job and only needed a thin second coat for these. The butt joints will need a bit more mud though. I have to fan out the small hill on both sides to make it wider. Here are the gaps I'm going to fill. I checked other spots just to get a feel for how much mudding I'll need to do on this second pass. Most of the screw holes were done, but a handful needed to be hit again. I may not mud like the pros, but whatever I'm doing is working, so I'll just keep going at it. The second pass of the taper joints were a piece of cake. I just made sure I didn't skimp on the mud. My goal was to not do a third coat. Spoiler alert, I didn't have to. Got it done in two. For the butt joints, I slapped a bunch of mud in the crevices that needed to be filled, then gently feathered it to make it pretty much smooth. The key here is to put just the right amount of pressure on the drywall knife. Another day layer and the second coat was cured, so I went to work doing the final sanding pass. I used a flashlight this time to get a much better look at where to sand and when to stop. When you shine a light at the wall at a sharp angle, you can easily see shadows where it isn't smooth. I hit it with the sandpaper until all the lumps were gone and I could feel a smooth surface with my hand. I repeated this process on the entire wall. It was time consuming, but well worth it to get as smooth a wall as possible. Again, this part is just really dusty. I used a broom to pull a majority of the lingering dust off the wall, then vacuumed it up. All the mudding was done, so now I could prep for paint. Even though I brushed dust off the wall, there was definitely still some there. So before putting any paint on the wall, I wiped down the entire surface with a damp sponge. I periodically cleaned off the sponge in a bucket and re-wet it. In addition to getting the dust off, the damp sponge also softens any edges that I may have missed during sanding. Last step before painting was to tape the edges. By this point, I already hung the plywood walls. I'll go over that in the next video, but that wood is going to stay unpainted. I taped all the edges of the drywall, even the curb that's visible at the base. Time to start painting. With new drywall, I always find it important to get a really good layer of primer on before paint because new drywall can soak up paint like a sponge. I still had this five gallon bucket of primer from when I worked on my kitchen. So I'll put it to good use here. It's interesting to see how it dries on the wall. With the drywall board, the primer dries relatively quickly. I think that's cause it soaks it up a bit and the paint on top of the mud seems to dry much slower it's cool to slowly watch it disappear into one uniform wall. Primer is done. Now it's time for the final paint. I went with straight out of the can white with an eggshell sheen. Just as an aside, I discovered these rubber lids for the paint cans and used them religiously. I've wasted too much paint spilling it while pouring it from the can to the tray. And if you bump the can or tip it, it won't splatter everywhere. They clean pretty easily too so you can reuse them over and over. Okay, let's roll. Ideally, I get this coated with one good coat, but it definitely took two coats to get clean coverage. Also, the first coat took an entire can. 
The second coat took about half a can. My plan for this wall at the moment is pretty simple. It's gonna be the backdrop for all the final videos of the projects I build. So there will be a clean backdrop with no distractions. Easy peasy. Also, a fun idea that I have for down the road is to hang a projector from the ceiling and have movie nights in the shop. So the wall would act as a movie screen. My stunt work allows me access to some movies before they hit the theaters. So it would be cool to watch them in a big way out here. Or watch the Super Bowl or World Series or the Olympics, or just regular movies. I mean, come on, how cool would it be to watch the Super Bowl on a giant wall? If you didn't notice, I went through with a brush to make sure the wall was painted all the way to the edges. The two coats were on, and all I had to do was clean up. I rolled up the paper that had been living there for a bit, and pulled off all the tape. And just like that, we have a newly done wall. The work done on the inside of the shop is super important to me because that's what you're gonna see in pretty much all my videos for the foreseeable future. So I've been taking this stuff seriously. Okay, next I'll show you how I hung the plywood on the walls. That was a job, but I'm super stoked with how it turned out. Stay tuned. Okay, that's it for now. See ya.